tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis. Many of us, as we think about midlife and beyond, we realize that what we need to do is save some money. That way we have something that we can actually count on as we get older. After all, many of us are probably in the kind of work that we really can't find ourselves working into our later years, especially if it's labor-intensive. One of the most difficult things, though, is deciding which way we can go when it comes to saving our money to get it to grow and work for us in the most diligent, progressive way that it can while giving us the kind of security and certainty that we're looking for. After all, you listen to the news, you watch people on CNN, and you realize these cable wealth systems that are always being pitched to us, they all sound good, but the fact is, is when you buy into some of these systems, what you're actually doing is you're making the person selling these products rich. On the Beyond 50 radio program today, we're going to learn some of the secrets that are used by the wealthy to lock in steady income on investments that you probably won't find anywhere else. The information is going to be today for investors of all ages. There are going to be examples that we can learn about investing in what are known as forever dividend stocks that can provide you with a steady flow of income, 24 dividend payments a year for an average yield of more than 3%. There's also things we're going to be talking about known as dividend aristocrat stocks that is specific index made up solely of stocks that give shareholders an annual raise. Our guest on the program today is the chief income strategist of Oxford Club and senior editor of the Oxford Income Letter, where he runs the instant income portfolio, compound income portfolio, and retirement catch-up high-yield portfolio. His newest book is actually a second edition, which is called Get Rich with Dividends, and I encourage people out there to pick up a copy of this, as you will learn the simplicity of the system that he teaches here, at the same time realizing you're going to have to roll up your sleeves and do some due diligence, but you're going to realize the payoff in the end is going to be phenomenal. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest and author of the book Get Rich with Dividends, Mark Lechtenfield. Mark, thank you for being on the program today. Hi, thank you for having me. You know, I will say this. We, we do a lot of uh, talks when it comes to investment and money and money management, but I will say what you've outlined here in this book is not only simple, and I do agree with what you say, it's going to take a little bit of work when it comes to doing your homework, as we always encourage people to do, but you realize that what you're showing here makes a heck of a lot of sense, and you don't hear people talking about this kind of thing out there. That's true, because there's not a lot of money to be made uh, by uh, by the institutions for investors who invest this way. It's, it's a very long-term strategy, very much a buy-and-hold strategy. So if you are with a broker and you buy, let's say, 10 stocks and hold them for 10, 15, 20 years, uh, generally speaking, they're not going to make a whole lot of money off of you uh, because you're not going to be trading very often. So they don't really have a whole lot of incentive to kind of push this strategy to the average investor. Well, you just said the key word there, you know, that they don't make a whole lot of money. And anybody who's seen the movie The Wolf of Wall Street remembers the beginning (laughs) of the movie with Matthew McConaughey saying, you know, look, it's all fairy dust. What you do is you keep pushing them to the next big idea. And a lot of people want that when it comes to investing, and it doesn't make any sense. (laughs) You know, they want that sexy thing. I wish I had, you know, gotten into Microsoft or, you know, maybe Apple Computers or perhaps even Nike. You know, you always hear this. But you've got to realize that these are areas that maybe you didn't have a whole lot of knowledge in. And one of the first things you talk about is getting involved with, uh, I guess, companies, if you will, that make sense, that you understand. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and just to, to backtrack for a second, when you're talking about getting in on the next Microsoft, I mean, keep in mind the, the really big money that was made in you know, the Facebooks and the Microsofts and, and those companies um, were, you know, th- those are very, very risky at the time that you would have gotten in to have made the big money. So yes, you could have, you could have struck it rich, but you're taking a, a very large risk uh, if you would have gotten in that early. So, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a, a very important to keep in mind. Now, I like uh, how you outline as you begin to explain how this all works, as you were talking about, you know, moving to Ashland, Oregon, of all places. I can't believe it. I was just <laughs> passing by that place a couple of weeks ago on my way down to Arizona, which is where my wife and I have decided to stay. And you were talking about opening up at a pizza restaurant. Now, you know, you talk about a risky endeavor. (laughs) (laughs) But let's talk about that story. And it was really neat the way you began to do the framework to explain what we're talking about here. Yeah, so uh, my wife and I, when we travel, 
especially before we had kids, we would tend to, you know, fall in love with everywhere that we went and kind of think about exiting the rat race and we'll open a pizza place here or a burrito place there or, or whatnot. Um, so Ashland was, is absolutely beautiful. We, we loved it there. And, um, you know, we thought that a, a pizza place might make sense, even though I know nothing about pizza other than eating it. Uh, but I, I figured, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was a pipe dream for maybe a few days. It wasn't anything I took too seriously. But uh, it, it's kind of one of those fantasies that we we go through uh, every so often. Um, and then uh, for me, at least, uh, reality kind of hit that, like I said, I don't know anything about the pizza business. And I should probably stick with what I know a little bit, a little bit more. Now, uh, let's talk about, okay, you start off with something everybody's heard of, you know, and the idea is that you try to save at least 10% of your income to put to work in what are known as dividend-paying stocks. Now, let's talk about what dividend-paying stocks are. Sure. So uh, these are companies that uh, pay what's called a dividend. They, they send money to their shareholders uh, either every quarter. Uh, some do every month, but most of them are every quarter. And that payment can can vary depending on the company. Some of them have very steady payouts. They'll, they'll always pay the same amount per share. Some uh, the companies that I really like are the what I call perpetual dividend raisers. These are companies that are raising that amount every single year. Uh, and then there are some that uh, that have a very um, variable dividend policy. So depending on how much money they make that quarter or that year that's how much they'll, they'll pay out. So let's say you own a stock that trades at $50. Maybe the company pays out uh, $1 per share uh, per year. Uh, that would be a, called a 2% yield, meaning you're getting 2% on your money every year. And maybe they do that every they, – they break that up a, a, out of every quarter. So you'd get $0.25 cents a share uh, every quarter. Uh, and then perhaps the next year they raise that to $1.20. So the following – you know, the following year, over the next four quarters, you would get 30 cents a share. Uh, so those are the companies that, that I'm specifically focused on, those companies that are raising that dividend every year so that you're making more money, uh, getting more money in your pocket every year, regardless of what the stock price is doing. Because, again, we, we want to hold these stocks for a very long time. So if the stock, if you bought it at 50 and it's at 48 the next year, that doesn't really matter to us because we plan on holding it for 10 years. But if we're getting a dollar per share in dividend this year and then a dollar 20 the next year, uh, that's that's a meaningful gain. That's a 20 percent increase in the in the income. Now, you know, people are going to hear things like percentages and go, OK, you know, well, uh, I'm kind of getting confused with this. So we're going to stay right here on the basic here just for a minute. Mm -hmm. Dividend stocks are important, as I was reading in your book, and I really like this because I remember going back and thinking about Warren Buffett, his investment strategy is the first thing is he he gets involved with companies where he understands what they do. That's why he rarely invests in technology. In fact, mm -hmm. an interesting story about him is that he was actually considered to make one of the worst decisions in investment history when he decided not to invest in Intel Corporation. Are you going to tell a guy that one time he was the richest guy on planet Earth through investing that he's an idiot? <laughs> really? You know, with all these other companies that he could invent right. that he invested in. But anyway, point being is that he would actually not only a invest in companies that he understood, you know, that he had a good feeling for what it is they do, but he also invested in companies that were long run. In other words, they had to be minimally ten years old and older. Right. But generally, they were much older than that. That's one of the things you talk about here. Now, it's important to invest in dividend yielding or paying companies, and I want you to explain to our listeners why that is, because when I read this, I was like, wow, that makes a heck of a lot of sense. Right. So these companies, as you mentioned, typically are a little bit more mature. You know, very, uh, it's pretty infrequent that you have a, a new company that, uh, that goes public and issues a dividend right away, because they're usually in, in hyper growth mode. And so any retained earnings uh, they're going to use to invest back in the business to grow. So when you have a company that's paying a dividend, they can still be growing and, and we want them to be growing. We want their earnings and cash flow to be growing. We're not generally interested in companies that have no growth, but they are more mature. And so at this point in their, in their, their development, they have plenty of cash. 
uh, both to, to sink back into the business, to increase research and development, to hire, but also to return some money back to shareholders. Um, so, you know, the, these, are, these are more stable companies. They've been around for a while. They've probably seen some ups and downs in the economy and the markets. Um, and the other, the other important thing is, especially for the companies that have raised their dividends for a long time, let, let's say 20, 30 years in a row, is they've set the bar pretty high for their shareholders. In other words, their share, shareholders have come to expect a dividend and that dividend to be increased every year. So if all of a sudden the company does not increase the dividend, that's a, a very telltale sign that something has changed. So, you know, if you have a company that's raised a dividend every year for 30 years in a row, and then suddenly they don't do it in year 31, that's signaling the market that, that there is some kind of a change here. Now, maybe they have a very valid reason for doing that, but it, whatever that reason is, it may, it, it may signal to shareholders that that change is, is possibly um, not, uh, you know, not in, in conjunction with the reason that they invested in the stock. And if they, if they don't explain that reason very well, um, then you know, the CEOs may be looking for a new job soon because shareholders and companies that raise the dividend every year for 30 years, like I said, have come to expect that dividend increase, and they're going to be very upset when they don't get it. So it's, I, I like it because it, it, it sets that bar very high for management uh, to, to hit that goal every year of raising the dividend. And, and they know that the, the shareholder base and, and it's not just the individual investors. It, it could be the institutions, too, that that shareholder base is expecting more cash return to them every single year. You know, the big thing, too, you were talking about in your book when it comes to, you know, companies having this excess cash is that uh, you were actually had asked questions to CEOs of companies why they do what they do. And, and it was really intriguing to see some of the answers that you were coming up with uh, getting from these CEOs. And they say, well, you know, when you sit on a lot of excess cash, what you tend to do is start making poor decisions. <laughs> and you gave certainly some good examples, and I think a lot of people know about it. If you're wanting to, you can talk a little bit about that. But I thought, you know, you start to make sense here because when you take a look at the world today and how we get into really volatile markets, you're always, you know, hearing on the news one thing, and it's usually always blood in the water kind of a situation. Sure. Or you start thinking, oh, well, what about Enron? <laughs> you know, if people really looked into that, they would have realized that was a, a train wreck, you know, already happening when it started. But the fact is, is you, you're looking at CEOs that say, yeah, we could do this, but here's a way that we can long-term ensure the health of our company, even when their prices do go down. Nothing ever just keeps going up. You know, that mm -hmm. should have been the alarm for the Enron situation. But the fact is, as they say, why not return that to our investors? Because what it does then is you were saying that CEOs and, and, and teams begin to make better decisions with this excess cash so that they're not out there making those costly mistakes like Quaker Oats did. <laughs> right. That's a, yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. That, one of the, the problems, uh, as you mentioned, when companies have a ton of cash is they make bad acquisitions because they feel pressure to do something with the cash. You know, they, it, it, they either have to return it to shareholders, they have to go buy something. Uh, you know, very few companies will just sit on billions and billions of dollars in cash. Uh, you know, some of the, some of the high tech companies like Cisco and Apple, uh, have, have tons of cash that uh, that they're still sitting on, but most companies will go out and spend it uh, if they don't return it to shareholders. And I, I think it's a uh, you know a pretty rare executive, uh, and, and I you know, did speak to one and, and quoted him in the book who who said basically this forces us to make good decisions. If we're if we're going to go buy another company, we you know, we have to have a real darn good reason to do it and and show that to shareholders. So. Um, I, I do like that idea of, of returning the, the cash to shareholders. And then if they do want to you know, buy another company, make an acquisition, there, there are plenty of ways a company can raise money if they need to. They can sell bonds. They can sell more shares. Uh, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not as advantageous as if you just had the cash and paid for it. But like we said, it, it, it forces them to make sure that that deal that they're doing, that money that they're investing in another business or some other – growth initiative really is the best use of their their capital. Uh, it really forces them to make good decisions. 
Okay, so the reason I wanted people to understand what we're talking about here is because you're looking at some real safety. You know, you're looking at a company that's been around for a long time. You're looking at teams that really understand how to really take care of a company's cash, especially when they have excess cash. So you're looking for that safety, and that's what I think a lot of people want to be able to do. I mean, sure, you want to go in for that big, sexy thing, but you don't buy into the idea that just because something has risk means you're going to have a high reward. That reward could be a lesson in the fact that you just lost a lot of money. So we've covered that. Now let's talk about a, it's a system that I guess you could be attributed to as being copyrighted. It's a 10, 10 11, 12. What exactly is that? Right. So the goal is uh, over 10 years to have, if you're, collecting the, the income every year from the stocks to achieve an 11% yield within 10 years, uh, which means that your money is earning 11% within 10 years, which obviously today would be an extremely high, uh, high you know, in, uh, interest rate if you were able to get that in a bank or on a bond. Uh, that would be incredible. Um, or if you're reinvesting the dividend, and I'll explain what that means in a moment, if you're reinvesting the dividend to have an average total return of 12% over the entire 10 years. And 12% may not sound like a lot, especially if you know, we're kind of talking about you know, shooting for the moon and getting those, those sexy stocks you're talking about. But 12% more than triples your money in 10 years. And if you're investing in you know, these mature, uh, safer stocks, if you triple your money in 10 years, you're doing pretty darn good. So, uh, so that's the goal there. And, and, and if I can just kind of go back to what I was saying about reinvesting dividends, if, if anyone in the audience is unfamiliar with that concept, basically what that means is when you get the dividend, instead of getting a check in the mail or having that cash deposited in your brokerage account, you automatically buy more of the stock with it. And it, it, most brokerages will let you do it for free, so it doesn't cost you anything. And what that does is it allows – for compounding and for the kind of that compounding machine to go into overdrive because you're buying more shares with your dividend. And as a result, you own more shares, so you get paid more dividends. So each time you get more shares, you get more dividends, which buys more shares, which gets more dividends, et cetera, et cetera. And you really uh, can take advantage of compounding over the long term when you do that. You know, that's the magic, too. So we got the safe companies going on, you know, the people that actually uh, you know, know what they're doing with their money and they want to be sure that they're keeping shareholders happy without making uh, unreasonable risks. Now you're talking about the dividends and the payoffs there and then reinvesting that money back into your stocks. Now let's talk about why that's important. Now you're, you're talking about compound interest, and that's key right there. And you also say that dividend-paying stocks a lot of times actually stay ahead of inflation. And as anybody who really gets into the investment game understands is two things you need to be able to do is you need to have the greatest tax advantages that you can. You know, you want to pay the minimal out as as little as you can when it comes to taxes, you know, take, get that tax break. But secondly, you got to stay ahead of inflation. Sure. And, and actually, you bring up a great point about taxes. So one thing that is important to understand is that if you own the stocks in a taxable account and you're reinvesting the dividends, you're still going to owe taxes on those dividends. Even though you didn't collect the cash, you, you automatically bought more stock. So you do need to have some cash on hand to pay the taxes. Now, if, you're, if those stocks are held in an IRA or 401k, then, then you know, the taxes are deferred until you withdraw the money. Um, so that, that's, that's really, really important to understand. Um, and then I'm, I'm Sorry, the second part of your question was? Uh, well, the idea is the also that you want to be able to stay ahead of inflation, too. Oh, That's inflation, the other thing right. people don't think about. So, Yeah, and, and the, another really good point, because inflation has been so low, so people really don't think about it. I mean, really, the only, the only, I don't know, items right now that seem to really be going up uh, significantly in price these days are health care and, and college tuition. Other than that, you know, most, most prices are, are pretty stable, yet you know, even 2 or 3% inflation – uh, can really eat away at your at your buying power over time, and so if you are invested in a stock that is raising that dividend every year, and, and if you're collecting the cash now, I'm not necessarily talking about rein, uh, reinvesting, but if you're collecting that cash and you're using that money to pay the bills, to uh, you know for for your lifestyle, and you're getting let's say uh, uh, an eight percent increase every year on average in your dividend, well, if inflation is three percent then even after taxes, your buying power is actually increasing. 
And that's, you know, that's really the goal here is to increase your buying power uh, or at the very least is, is maintain your buying power during, uh, you know, during inflationary periods. So uh, having those increases every year is, is critical. And, you know, it, it's, it's amazing if you, like I said, you can increase your buying power. I mean, you can actually improve your lifestyle depending on how much income you're getting from the dividend, but you can improve your lifestyle over the years. If like we're in now, if, if we stay in a low inflationary uh, environment for the next several years, let's say 2%, let's say even goes up to 3%, but you can get eight or 10% increases in your dividends every year. Uh, that's, you know, you're, you're making more money every year and, and, inflation the prices aren't going that much higher every year so it, it can really be a, a wonderful thing for your uh, retirement now i uh, got a question from a, a customer here apparently they did a little bit of research on you and your book and they were wondering how is it that you can get monthly payouts is that something that's possible sure so th- there's a few ways there's there are a few companies uh, that pay monthly dividends there, there's not too many of them um uh, Many of them tend to be closed-end funds, which are like mutual funds, but they trade more like stocks, and, and we can get more into that if you, if you want. But um, really the easiest way, though, is to kind of structure your portfolio so that the dividends uh, are paid at different times. So like I said, uh, companies generally pay quarterly dividends. So uh, you could get, you know, you could set it up so that you have a company that pays you a dividend in January, a different one that pays you in February, a different one that pays you in March, and then it, you know, kind of rolls over again. So the one that paid you in January will pay you in April, and so on. Uh, and so if you if you have a diverse portfolio of dividend-paying stocks, chances are you'll have, you know, most if not every month covered as far as the dividends you're receiving. And if, if you, if you want to make it so that it's consistent, that you're, you know, you're getting a certain amount every month, you'd have to kind of plan that out depending on the amount of dividends that each company pays and when they pay. So it, it can be done, but generally speaking in a, in a diverse portfolio, you'll, you'll probably get paid close to every month anyway. Now you certainly go into detail about the kinds of stocks to take a look at, and this is something that I would encourage listeners to actually read in the book rather than listening to a brief overline here on the program. But uh, you know, to kind of summarize things, you know, you take a look at companies uh, that have a long track record, companies that actually know how to take care of their cash. Uh, certainly you want to uh, reinvest this, you know, especially the dividends instead of taking them out, you know, running out there and spending the money. Use that to actually reinvest back in so you can use the power of compound interest, compounding. Now, I'll tell you, this is when it becomes infectious. Uh, To give you an idea, I remember many years ago when we started doing, uh, I guess it was the Google AdSense program for our YouTube channel. I remember when I first got started, my wife says to me, you know, what do we even bother with that for? What do they pay you last month, like three cents? And I said, well, you know, what do you care? It didn't cost us anything to get started. All I had to do was sign up. And three cents is better than what we had yesterday, right? (laughs) You know, but then all of a sudden, you know, they have a threshold. I think it's you got to earn one hundred dollars your first, you know, one hundred dollars, and they'll actually cut you a check. Then all of a sudden, I think it was probably about two years later, and we're talking two years, so that's a lot of patience here. So for those people out there that think you're going to be this flash in the pan, you know, with that viral video that's going to make you all this money, find something else to do because it isn't going to really happen. So after two years, we finally got our first $100 check. Then I think it was about eight months later, we got paid again. <laughs> now people are thinking, well, that seems like a, a silly investment strategy. But again, the only thing I invested was my time to sign up. Right. Then I cut down to five months. Then pretty soon it was three months. Then pretty soon we were getting paid every month. Then pretty soon that began to you know, go up to like 125, then 150, then 175, you know, and this is every month now. And then pretty soon it was up to two, 250, 300. This is every month. Now that's a course of probably about six years, about four or five, six years right around there. You know, and again, and that's exactly what you're talking about here. So, you know, if you're thinking about something that's going to give you this big payoff right away, find something else to do. But if you're looking for safety and consistency you know, with a great payoff, once you see that begin to happen, you're going to want more of it. So you're talking about the infectious, you know, feeling that people can feel when it comes to investing. And then they start paying attention as it begins to work, don't they? 
Oh yeah, and, and that's that is a key point that that you do have to be patient because this this does take time. And, and when you kind of look at the numbers in the first few years, um, you know, and it depends a little bit on how the market performs, obviously. Uh, but if, if we're just assuming historical market averages, you know, it, it takes a few years for the numbers to start getting really impressive. But once you start getting to about year eight, year nine, uh, the numbers really start to take off. And, you know, that's when compounding really kind of starts to work its magic. And so uh, just using this 10, 11, 12 system that I talked about, if you're, if you're getting about a 12% return, uh, it takes you about seven years to double your money. But then it, so let's say you invested $10,000, it would it'd take you about seven years to get to 20000 but then only about another four years to get to 30000 uh, And then, you know, another two years to get to 40000 And so you, you can see that as you go on, the numbers just get larger and larger and larger. And the longer you can, can just hold the positions and, and not sell them, uh, you know, you really have the opportunity to create a significant amount of wealth. And so, you know, what I would hope is, is that anybody that, that has the ability to do it would be able to reinvest their dividends for as long as possible. And then when they start to need some money, hopefully they've built enough of a nest egg that they don't have to actually sell any stock. They can just then, instead of reinvesting the dividends, just take the income and just let that, that nest egg stay generating income every, every month or every quarter uh, rather than having to sell down your investments, which is what so many people have to do, and it's certainly understandable. But if, if you start early enough and can, can let that compound for a while, then there is an opportunity to just let your, your nest egg generate income instead of selling it off. See, and that's where a little bit of a light went on for me, especially with this book, because you constantly, especially I remember getting into the investment world and, and try, coming to understand that how money works, and I realized, what am I doing, you know, in my late 30s learning this stuff for? <laughs> Why didn't anybody teach us this in school? You know, the only thing I can remember when it came to finance in school, and this is no kidding, and I think it was in high school, of course, kids today in high school seem to be smarter than I think we were when we were in high school, but... You know, they taught us how to balance a checkbook. You're exactly. spending money. This is ridiculous, mm -hmm. you know. Now, this book here, I think, is an excellent book for parents and perhaps even grandparents to say, kids, let's sit down and let's work with the magic of what he's talking about here. You can come to understand how the economy works, how much nonsense you can read and see in the news, <laughs> especially. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, you, you just hit on something that's really key for people to understand here that I think should be made clear again is that you say, don't invest for income according to how much money you need or when the dividend is paid, but invest in quality companies, as we've been talking about, with strong dividend performance. And the most important thing to look at is that you look at pay, payout ratios where the cash flow is important. Now, what is that exactly? Sure. So a lot of people confuse cash flow with earnings. And, and the best way to um, – Here's an example of how I can describe it. Let's say you own, let's say you own that pizzeria in Ashland that I always wanted to buy, um, and you you earn a hundred thousand uh, dollars. That's that's the that's your your profit, and that's what's reported to the government. Well, in those earnings, you know, you've you've taken out your expenses like you know the the pizza dough and the rent for the place, um, but there are other other not what they call non cash items that get factored into earnings, things like if you bought what they call capital equipment, let's say you bought the, the oven for $50,000 and you bought it two years ago, you, you laid out that money two years ago, but that, do, that doesn't come off of your income. That is not calculated in your profits. And it's, it's an accounting trick. But that's really what it is. But instead, it, you get to depreciate the asset over five years. So you would take ten thousand dollars off um, off your income uh, every year. So, in other words, you've you've made a profit of one hundred thousand dollars. That's what you uh, that's what you filed your taxes on. That's uh, that's you know all the all the official documents say you've earned a hundred thousand dollars. But ten thousand of that was a non cash item, money that you actually paid out two years ago. So the money you actually take home to your family would be $110,000. And that's basically cash flow. Cash flow gets rid of all these non-cash items 
uh, and, and really is a, is a true measure of how much cash came into and went out of the business and, and gets rid of all the accounting tricks. So that's why I look at cash flow. Um, it, it's more important to me to understand how much cash is coming into the company rather than the earnings. And earnings is, is what gets the, the big number, gets the headline. It's what they report on CNBC and, um, you know, did the company. Yeah, so what, well, you earned all this money. How come I didn't get anything or I lost right. it? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but the cash flow represents the actual cash. So if I'm looking at a dividend and whether a company can afford to pay that dividend, I want to know how much cash they brought into the company. So um, when I look at a payout ratio, that's, that's simply the ratio of, or the percentage of how much of the cash flow that came into the company is paid out in dividends. So if a company, um, its company cash flow was $10 million and they paid $5 million in dividends, the, ca- the payout ratio would be 50%. If they paid out uh, $2 million, the payout ratio would be 20%. Uh, so that's, the, that's a really important number because you want to know that the company is generating enough cash to pay the dividend. If they generated uh, $10 million in cash flow but paid out $15 million in dividends, that means that money had to come from somewhere else. That $5 million had to come from either cash on hand or they had to borrow money to pay the dividend. You know, that, that money had to come from somewhere. So that you want to make sure that the company can afford to pay the dividend every year. And, that, and especially if you're looking at a company that's growing the dividend, you want to know that their cash flow is going up and that there's, there's a little margin for error as well in case they have a rough year or two, but they'll still be able to increase the dividend. Now, I, I find it uh, sometimes appalling that when you do see on, uh, so let's say, network or cable television when it comes to money management, money investment, money news, they always talk about the stock market overall or the S&P 500. What you're talking about here is we're talking about individual companies. And, and I like that you said fairly consistently throughout your book is that you can also make a lot of money reinvesting dividends in a stock market that declines. Now, how is that possible? Right. So, so the key is that you don't panic and sell the stock because the stock price is down. Because it's very important to understand that just because a stock goes down in price doesn't mean its dividend is going down. Right. So during the, the crisis in, in 2007 and 8 and 9, when you know, stock prices got, got crushed, but there were hundreds of companies that raised their dividend during that time and, mm-hmm. and plenty more that kept their dividend intact. So the two are not correlated at all. Now, if, if a company is, is struggling because there's a recession and they're not bringing in, you know, they're not earning money, they're not bringing in cash flow, that's a different story. But it, it is important to understand that just because we're in a recession or just because stock prices go down doesn't mean that the yield goes down. So now when it comes to reinvent, uh, reinvesting dividends in a bear market, um, that can be, I would say that can be an investor's best friend because let's say a stock is trading at $20 and it pays a $1 per share dividend, um, and you, you own uh, 100 shares. So you get $100 in dividends, and that would buy five shares of stock, in which then the next, uh, the next year you would have uh, even more dividends. If the price goes down, the stock price goes down. Now let's say the stock price, it's a, it's a terrible bear market. The stock price gets cut in half, it's $10 a share, but you're still getting paid that $1 in dividend. Well, $1 per share dividend, now you're buying 10 shares of stock instead of five with your dividend, and you're still getting $1 per share in dividends on that $10, uh, $10 per share stock, those 10 shares you just bought. So you're getting more dividends. So when the stock price goes down and you're reinvesting the dividend, you buy more stock, which then kicks out more dividends, which buys more stock, which generates more dividends, and so on and so on. Sounds so, like it's breeding like bacteria. That's just not good when it comes to money, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but I like what so, you're saying, and, I, and I, I like that we were able to come to this point naturally because I wanted people to understand why when the market goes down, you should be going, you know, I think I want to go out and celebrate on this one. <laughs> yeah, and if you're, if you're investing for the long term and reinvesting those dividends, it, it really can be one of the best things that can happen to you because mm-hmm. – we, we do know that markets go up over the long term. And so even if we have a, a terrible crisis like we had in 2008, 2009, which was really historic, uh, and, and it, it could certainly happen again, um, you got to buy a lot more stock that generated more dividends, and, and prices do tend to recover over the long term. So you know, the, really the issue is 
if, if you need the money in the next few years, it, it shouldn't be in the stock market. I always say if you need the money within the next three years, it should not be in the stock market because if prices go down, you won't be able to handle that either emotionally or uh, it, it will cost you a lot of money if you end up selling. So if you have that long-term time horizon, if you're, if you're investing for 10 years or more, uh, and we hit a, another even nasty bear market, as long as the company them, themselves that you're invested in are, are, are still earning money, they're still generating cash, uh, I always say, who cares about the stock price? I mean, it's, it's no fun to look at it go down and open up your statements and see that your, your net worth has gone down. But if, if the company is solid and it's generating and increasing those dividends and the price is down and you're reinvesting it, it's the best thing that can happen to you because once the stock price goes back up, you're going to have so many more shares and it's going to generate so much more income when you do need it because you have so many more shares. You know, and that gets very exciting. And, uh, you know, this is one of those things that cause people to become infectious about what they're doing. And it's kind of interesting when you bring it up this particular way because it creates sort of a paradox, which you typically hear people, especially call them investors, but I would say they're traders, you know, buy low, sell high. In this case here, you're hoping that you're kind of buying high and hoping that it goes low so that you can buy more. <laughs> you know, that's kind of a reverse psychology, but you can see its effectiveness over the long term is what you're talking about. Sure. I mean, and, and you know, obviously we, we prefer to buy low and then buy more lower. Sure. Uh, you, know, you never want to buy too high, but um, yeah, it, it, it really is, you know, for, for me, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm, I'm right in your uh, kind of the bottom end of your, uh, your target audience uh, age. Um, so I still have uh, a few decades, hopefully to invest. And yeah, if, if the market goes down for, for my personal portfolio, um, you know, I'm reinvesting those dividends. I'm not. I'm not going to blink. It, it'll. You know, I'm. I'm in, in a way, I'm. I'm hoping it happens. I mean, it's not good for most people, but for me personally, with you know, 10, 15, 20 years to invest, um, it, it, I'll, I'll welcome that opportunity. And, and it's not even. It's not even about you know, committing more capital and and seeing it as a buying opportunity necessarily. I mean, that that can always be the case in a bear market. But it's just about kind of letting this this process happen automatically, reinvesting those dividends and um, and just accumulating more and more shares of great companies that are raising the dividend every year. Absolutely, and I think it's exciting because even people who are 50, 55, and 60, you can still do this, but what you got to do is you have to get started, and that's the most important thing. So now that we're at that point, let's talk about how somebody gets started. Uh, you know, certainly you can go to somebody who's a money manager, and as we talked about earlier in the program, they may kind of be looking out for their own best interest. You know, that's just what their job is. But the fact is, is this is something that if you do your due diligence, you do some of your homework. It's funny how people will spend a lot of time researching the newest TV for the best deal or the newest mm -hmm. car. You know, but those things don't make any money. Those aren't assets. Those are just entertainment gadgets, doodads, if you will. But let's talk about how somebody can get started on their own. And is that possible? Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's There's – all kinds of terrific free resources on the web uh, to help you get started. There's, there's one I mentioned in the book. Uh, the website is dripinvesting.org, D-R-I-P, which stands for Dividend Reinvestment Plan. Uh, so dripinvesting.org, and uh, it, it's totally unaffiliated with me or any, any uh, you know, or the Oxford Club or any, any business I'm affiliated with. Um, but it, it, it's a terrific free website, and if you go there, uh, they have a, a link to click on tools, and it's an Excel spreadsheet, and it lists every company that has raised the dividend for five years or more in a row. And so that's just a, a terrific place to get started looking for quality companies, uh, and you can sort it by yield, by the dividend growth. There's, there's just a ton of free information there. Um, so that, that's one way to, to get started. Um, and there's you know, a lot of free websites that have good information on the companies if you want to start digging into kind of the analysis, um, you know, seeing how much a company generates in cash flow or earnings and what they pay in dividends, marketwatch.com, uh, yahoofinance.com, morningstar.com. Uh, so there's, there's, there's tons of, of uh, really good information for free on the web. Uh, Nasdaq.com is another uh, good free website. And, um, and also, our website, WealthyRetirement.com, doesn't necessarily offer you individual uh, stock analysis as far as you know, whether you should buy or, or sell an individual stock or, or 
have their balance sheets or income statements or anything like that, but has a lot of good uh, tips on, on how to get started investing, things you should be looking at, you know, uh, things to watch out for, thing, you know, that kind of a thing. Now, if you can, just uh, briefly tell uh, our listeners what the DRIP is. Sure. So, as I mentioned, DRIP is Dividend Reinvestment Plan. And so if you want to reinvest your dividends, basically you want to have it done automatically because if you do it on your own, you have to pay a commission every time. So let's say you own shares of Coca-Cola, you get the dividend uh, deposited into your account as cash and you want to buy more shares, you would have to then go buy more shares and it's going to cost you you know, as little as, as $7 if you're one of, one of the discount brokers or more if you're with uh, a more expensive broker. If you do it automatically, it doesn't cost you anything. And just as soon as uh, basically the cash doesn't really even hit your account. I mean, it, it's just automatically done. And so you can do that two ways. One is directly through the company that you're invested with. So if you own Coca-Cola, you could have Coca-Cola reinvest it for you. Um, I don't recommend doing it that way because typically these companies charge money uh, for you to do that. There's some kind of a commission both to buy stock and sell it. And then they kind of are holding the shares for you. And if you're doing it with a bunch of different companies, then there's a lot of things to keep track of. If you do it with your broker, um, almost all brokers will allow you to do it for free. They'll, they'll handle it for you for free. So all the information is in your one brokerage account. So you can have 10 stocks. You're, div- you're reinvesting the dividends on all of them. It happens automatically. And so every time you get a statement, you'll see, uh, you know, this month I owned 100 shares of Coca-Cola. And next month I owned 101 point three shares, the next month 102.5 shares, and so on. And like I said, it doesn't cost you anything. You just have to let the broker know that you want your dividends reinvested automatically and they take care of it. And it, it really couldn't be simpler. Now, why is it that the company, though, charges, but yet a broker doesn't? Uh, that's a good question. I assume there's, there's you know, a lot of paperwork to handle. I mean, they're, they're basically paying another company to handle it for you. Um, you know, Coca-Cola isn't keeping track of it, they hire a company to take care of all that for you. And so there's paperwork and fees that they have to pay. And um, yeah, it's just another way of, of, of the, for this other company to generate some fees. Whereas with a broker, you know, most of the discount brokers, especially these days, really want to make things as easy for the investor as possible because they want, they want to hold as, as you know, much of your assets as possible and have them be your go-to financial institution. So whatever they can do to, to make it easy and convenient and, and even more so these days cheap, uh, these discount brokers are very inexpensive these days, um, they're going to they're gonna do it to, so that you're, you're handling as much of your financial activity through them as possible. Gotcha. And so ultimately when it comes to the end, one of the things you really want to do your homework on is taxes. How much will this cost you when it comes to paying the government? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And so right now in, in the United States, dividends are taxed uh, at 15%. And if you're in the upper, you know, the top tax brackets, it'll cost you uh, 20% plus. Then there's the Obamacare uh, tax that goes along with that. So it can be as much as 23.9% if you're a very high earner or as low as 15%. So that's what I was saying earlier. If you are reinvesting the dividend in a taxable account, you do have to have the cash to pay you the taxes on those dividends uh, every year, even though you're you're not collecting the cash. Um, but if, if you're in an IRA or a 401k, then, then those taxes are deferred. And you know, every every few years, there's talk that the, the taxes are going to change on on dividends. I, I don't think in the new tax uh, proposal by uh, the president, uh, I haven't seen anything about dividends um being taxed at a different rate so uh, theoretically it, that should stay relatively the same maybe if, uh, if obamacare goes away then we'll lose that that three extra 3.9 percent but uh, I, I don't expect anything drastic to change in the next year or so as far as uh, dividend taxes but you know with, with washington and politics you never know so no, nothing yeah sure. that's for sure <laughs> well mark i want to thank you for being on the program today the book is get rich with dividends and this is in its second edition and i understand you're coming out with another book here soon yes in march i have a book coming out uh, called you don't have to drive an uber in retirement and it's all about different ways you can generate income uh in retirement without getting a job 
uh, or uh, and, and also ways of saving money in retirement also without clipping coupons. So it's you know kind of easy and fun ways of, of doing both. Well, that sounds like fun. I'd like to have you back on the program and share this. I mean, again, this uh, information from your book, as small as this was, I was really surprised at the simplicity it was to read. There was an eagerness to continue forward like, wow, you know, this makes a lot of sense. Even for somebody who may be a layman and just starting to get the financial language down, it wasn't complicated, you know, I thought in any way, shape, or form. And it just made sense. You thought, you know, maybe I can do this, you know, roll up your sleeves and do the homework and do what you outline in your book and certainly, you know, make sure that you read it. That's the first step. And then go ahead. uh, I'm sure that there's a website people can find out more about your information and how they might be able to get directed on how they can get started above and beyond your book. Absolutely. So our free website is wealthyretirement.com. And uh, there's, like I said, there's all kinds of information on there. And then also if you go to oxfordclub.com, uh, you can get information on, on my newsletter, the Oxford Income Letter, if, uh, if you want help with actually picking the stocks, as we, we do recommend individual stocks uh, that follow this 10, 11, 12 system uh, and investing in companies that raise their dividends every year. Well, very good, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us here on the program today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. Again, do your due diligence and do your homework so you can find out how this all works and you can make it work for you. You can also discover more by visiting us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter and stay up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as our upcoming programs. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway. Halfway.